So uh, just to make matters more awkward, Marissa is our first candidate that's going to have to hold the microphone while she speaks. And then when you ask questions, you're going to have to hold the microphone too. That's just how it rolls. So okay. you can sit or you can stand. Let's do this. We'll I'll start sitting well. and see where that goes. So um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you Marissa Boyajian. <laughs> I'll give you a quick introduction. Uh, Marissa is currently serving as the interim principal of the Mary Lee Burbank School. Prior to that, she worked as an elementary principal in the Lawrence Public Schools, as well as in the Woburn Public Schools. Before this school year, she served as the Director of Human Resources for the Woburn Public Schools. Her teaching career in public education spans several decades as a member of the Lawrence Public Schools until she uh, sorry, <laughs> Lawrence Public Schools, where she served roles including classroom teacher and mathematics specialist. She brings a BS in psychology uh, from Merrimack College in Andover, as well as an MED in elementary education from Endicott College in Beverly. We're happy to have her among our finalist candidates. So Marissa, uh, we'll give you a minute or two just to sort of introduce yourself. I mean, you already know everyone since you're here, but just, uh, just any first words. And then uh, we have a couple questions that the staff put together, the questions, and, uh, and I will give the microphone to whoever is asking the question. Okay. All right? Hi, everybody. Thank you. Is that working? Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to be here to speak to um, my love of the school that I've, I've started in. And, is this working? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that I started working in just seven months ago? Okay. Maybe I should stand there. No? <laughs> uh, that I started working here just seven months ago, but I feel like um, I've been here a lot longer. Um, I feel like it was a, it was a school that I kind of walked into um, early on, and, and you were kind of already, you've already hit the ground running. And um, I appreciated the way that I was able to come in and kind of watch how you run things here. And, and ever since it's been, um, I've been very fortunate to see how you um, pretty much have taken the roles on that you have, um, when otherwise it, it might have, things might have been um, variable. And like I said, I'm just proud to have the opportunity to be here and, and hopefully move forward with you all. go about building rapport and fostering unity within the school, thinking staff, um, students, and families? And then how do you see this impacting the work we do with students? Um, read that first part again. I might do this a lot. I feel like I do this a lot. With the asset um, how would you go about building rapport and fostering unity within the school? OK. Um, it starts with um, finding as many opportunities uh, especially in the beginning stages, if, if I was here, and, and you know, even from what I've observed here, um, building um, a community of collaboration, um, making sure that across all um, all roles, across all school wide, um, people come together, share responsibilities for the sake of uh, serving all children, um, groups of children, classrooms filled with children, individual children, um, to make sure that it's a team approach. Um, I feel as if that is built internally first. We ensure that we get the support of our families to make sure that our students coming in, that they're being modeled, that that's a, a collaboration tool that everyone's working together. I feel like that's a model that um, can only uh, serve our students well, knowing that they are um, surrounded by uh, groups of people, a team of people who are here to make sure that they are um, succeeding at the highest levels. Our second question comes from Janet. Uh, hi, Marissa. Hey. Describe your leadership style and what a typical day as principal would look like. The first one's easier. <laughs> that second one, like, that, that's fluctuating. Um, it's hard to describe yourself when you're walking through what you do every day and what you've done for years. Um, I would have to say resolute, if that makes sense. Um, I come in every day determined to make sure that I come in um, loyal, to the building, loyal to the school, making sure that our students, like I said, are the, the highest achieving. Uh, they come here feeling successful, leaving successful, um, and ensuring that our, our staff come in as well, making sure that they, uh, they know that I have a, uh, a staunch commitment to them, to their successes, um, with a full knowing that your success is the children's success. So to be able to um, uh, be not only um, there, available, um, supportive of, of anything, whether it's a team support that you're needing, whether it's individual support that you need in order to make sure that you're focusing on student needs. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm extremely approachable and ready to do that. Um, read that last part again. What was the last part? Day, typical. A typical day. 
So with all that said, all of that can be encapsulated in, in a typical day where I'm asked to use both um, instructional leader hat and building manager hat um, and just colleague hat. So that being said, it's, it's, um, I feel like I'm able to toggle both. I feel like I can uh, meld both of those together on any given day. So um, with that said, it could, it could uh, start the day off me coming into a meeting, whether it's a parent meeting, um, a, a student, a child study meeting, whatever it happens to be, um, making sure that I'm prepared to be able to, to give feedback and provide um, kind of some oversight into whatever the meeting happens to be about, um, using either my instructional leader hat uh, and or the building ma manager hat. Um, and from there, it's making sure that, that all students are in, they're in seats, they're, they're where they need to be, teachers are prepared, they're, they're ready to go. Um, and I guess that's the best time of the day, coming in just kind of when everyone's settled, they get in, it, there's a, a hush over the school that you know that everybody's where they are, everyone's ready to learn, um, and the teachers are, are prepared to, to give them the best for the day. Uh, once that happens, it's you know going in and out of classrooms to make sure that, you know just see if it's, if, there's high instruction going on. There's high expectations for students going on. Um, students are, are they're grouped appropriately. They're grouped, um, it, they're, they're individual. They're in, in direct um, lessons. So uh, beyond that, yeah, I mean, every day is different and just have to be ready for the, the, the day of a, uh, the, and the life of a principal that could, you know, start off in one direction and quickly take a, a sharp turn right and then back left again. Hi, Brenda. Um, we would like to know your understanding of early elementary literacy and math, because next year we will be a K-3 mm -hmm. school, so we wanted to know, and then I'll have a follow-up after. Okay. Um, so as far as early literacy goes, um, it's from the, from the get-go, it's ensuring that the, the pieces of our curriculum that we do have are in place to be able to provide um, those decoding skills, those, those um, f uh, phonemic awareness skills, uh, building those, whether it's through, you know, um, active movement um, or just tapping or just having into that individual attention as, as, as uh, students are, are learning foundational skills. Um, from there, we, again, we move on to different parts um, and, and ensure that, that decoding and those phonic skills and all of those are building up to reading, to reading skills, reading words, and then reading, um, you know, longer sentences to get up to the, the fluency piece. Um, where they're able to kind of gradually release and, and produce some of those skills on their own um, with less support over time, obviously. Um, what's, the rest, what's the rest of that? Um, math. Ma oh, okay. Um, I would say same with math, early math, or just math instruction in general? Well, math instruction in K-3. Okay. Um, so I feel like it's the same, obviously, from K. You need to kind of build those foundational skills to be able to, to think critically um, apply those very foundational basic uh, fluency skills. Um, and from there, those fluency skills should be able to um, lead to uh, those wider open-ended problems where they're able to apply those skills, um, skills that they, you know, when they're given a, a gamut of, of skills that they can apply to solve a certain type of problem, um, that they feel comfortable being able to access what they um, most, uh, they feel most comfortable putting forward in order to make sure that they're eliciting a response that makes sense to them. Um, and from there, it's, it's ensuring that they give an opportunity to, to speak about their responses. So with that, we're opening up dialogue, we're opening up discourse to make sure that we're talking to them about math, not just asking what they know and put it down there, but we're um, giving them true open-ended questions that allow them to think critically the, where they're at, um, explain themselves, explain their way of thinking with the understanding that uh, the best part of those com conversations come from the student next to you who looking at you saying, oh, I, did, I got that, but I, you know, this is how I did it. Um, for me, that's always been the, the, um, the best part of, of teaching, is to be able to get students to that point where they're comfortable, they, they feel safe, and they, um, you know, they're not afraid to, to say that you said it something, you said it a different way. Um, I'm expressing myself, and I feel safe expressing myself in a way that um, also lets you know how I think about math. Okay, I think you touched upon this a little bit, but I want to just clarify it. When you walk into a classroom, um, whether they're teaching literacy or math, mm -hmm. what are you looking for and expecting to see? Yep, so a lot of that is exactly what I just kind of circled, come, came out of my head with. Um, going into a classroom, like I said, students are engaged. Students are engaged and um, teachers are either uh, facilitating. The teacher is the facilitator of the classroom. Um, if I walked into a beginning of a class, there's direct instruction going on. That direct instruction ensures that everybody 
um, regardless of, of tiered instruction, everybody has access to the same, um, to the same content, to the same unit, to the same skill, um, to the same objective. So with that said, there's different ways to go about assessing the understanding, making sure that that, that information is delivered to everybody with a constant check-in saying any questions, um, listening to kids talk. So it's, it's the talking that really I wanna walk in and, and hear uh, more student-led di uh, dialogue than teacher at some point. So obviously we need that direct instruction, but then to kind of take a step back and say, all right, your turn, what do you get? For so I feel comfortable as a teacher saying, okay, we're ready to release you now to small group. So we're ready to move on to this next part with the understanding that, you know, I'm gonna come around and make sure that you are um, asking questions as needed. I can ask you, you know, how did you do this? Or, or can you, you know, what do you know about this? Uh, what do you know about the, this sentence or whatever it happens to be? And how do you, how do you know that those two sounds um, go together? Like, wh what, what do you get from that? Um, so going from a, from a more teacher-directed, this is what we're all going to share in the learning together before gradually releasing them off and putting them in positions where now they're kind of taking ownership of the, of the, um, of the skill and kind of sharing it until going off and being able, able to assess whether or not they can apply it independently. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what is your experience in, and how do you see yourself supporting students in, with diverse learning needs and their families in our school community? Um, I, I, yeah, okay. Um, so that starts off with a strong schedule. It's a schedule that allows um, collaboration with uh, appropriate staff, not just, not just gra um, uh, team, grade level teams, but all appropriate staff, which would include our special ed support staff, our, um, our OT, PT, speech, um, and obviously our, our EL teachers as well, to make sure that they all have um, a hand in ensuring that our diverse needs of our students are met uh, to the best that we can, um, and where we could do better, we make those adjustments. But to ensure that all, um, all diverse groups are able to be um, seen, heard, um, grouped, and instructed with, and again, that extends out to the families to make sure that they are um, that they are a part of the, that community and, and understand that their child's needs are being met um, within that collaboration. It also comes with appropriate PD to make sure that we are instilling those skills and those and, and those um, opportunities for for uh, tiered learning for those groups, um, whether it's it's uh, school specific because we know what our kids need best, and this is how we can strategize to go about grouping and and just making sure that these. Uh, these levels of these the, the, the tiers are being uh, implemented, um, and district wide to make sure that that the, the district that the district PD is aligned with we want what what we want for our um, diverse population. And you might have touched upon it a little bit, but how do you support the staff in supporting diverse learning needs? I would say it's the same thing, ensuring that they have the tools, um, the resources, and um, the professional development that they need to be able to do it, whether it's, it's shifting staff around to make sure that they do, um, whether it's making sure that we may have to adjust schedules in some way to make sure that um, the staff member or, or, or staff members um, are actively working collaboratively, are working and, and they have what they need and, and they are where they need to be, when they need to be um, with those uh, identified or, or particular students. Hey, Vicki. Would you take to support a child who's having behavior difficulties? Um, well, I can say this school um, is amazing at kind of letting me walk through this. Um, the, the stinkiest part of this job is being seen as, okay, you're going to the principal. If you don't do this, you're going to the principal. So that always for me has been something that coming from a classroom, coming from where I came from as far as um, uh, ensuring that I'm not that person. Uh, I, this school is amazing at making sure that when there is a child, and read that first part again. Okay, um, I can tell you that the, the, the layers that we go through before it gets to me um, is amazing. It's, it's almost like it's, it's autopilot. So if there is a child who, who, you know, is having a tough time, is emotionally or, or physically dysregulated, um, is causing a disruption, causing a distraction, you know, there are the supports that they likely already, if they don't already have the, the supports who are, are um, recognizing and kind of proactive to these things, 
Um, it could be something like the uh, like a member of the CPI team who is familiar with that child to go down first. Um, obviously, beginning with the classroom teacher who is you know doing what they can to make sure that they're redirecting, uh, trying to get them back on task, um, and just trying to make sure that they're giving them every opportunity to kind of take a breath, kind of sort this out, and get back to learning. When that doesn't happen, like I said, it seems to be layer two goes to what can we do now? Do you need it? Do you need a break? Do you need to um, you know kind of come back? Especially if it's getting to the point where it's it's taking um, uh, attention and, and distraction away from other students who are trying to work. Um, when all fails, uh, like I said, it's it's um, for me, and especially as we're all getting to know each other, it's it's for me. I I'm coming in as not the heavy. I'm coming in as all right. Let's go talk about this. Um, if it's become such a disruption or distraction, or even you know maybe an infraction of a, of, of the discipline code, um, it's it's important to hear the child out, to get them in, to get them in a, a space where um, they're able to kind of decompress be able to talk about it, also understanding that you know we, we need to talk about the choice that you made, what you need to do, what can we do next time to make sure we don't get to this point. Um, for me, that's where I end up. And I, I feel like I've been effective, very effective at ensuring that kids aren't crying when they run out of my office. They're not, you know, they're not scared to come to my office after an interaction or, or some kind of a resolution we've been able to come to and get them safely back into class and learning. Um, at times, is there, you know, would there be discipline where we need to call the, to the point where we need to call mom just to let them know? Absolutely. Should that come for me sometimes? Yep, if it gets to my level. Um, but for the most part, it's just a matter of um, these, are, I mean, these are babies. So you, you know what? Um, let's see what we can't do next time to either come up with a strategy to, to think first, <coughs> breathe first, um, before acting. Hey, Lise. To be successful in this position, what would you have accomplished in your first several years? Um, I would say it's going to start especially with the um, significant dynamic of a new school look next year. It's going to start with a, um, with a kind of a revamped schedule. So that being said, it's, um, it's, going to, it's going to have to be creative to make sure that we're building a culture, first of all, a culture of collaboration. Um, where it's not, again, the way the schedule is built from my, the way I've walked through it, um, there's not even, even with the, the staff meetings and things like that, that and when we all get together, we're able to come together as, as a group to be able to kind of make school decisions and, th and things of that nature and talk about feedback that might make our school dynamic and, and um, teaching dynamic better for our kids. Um, so uh, what I would hope for is that a, a schedule is made that, accounts for um, all of our staff and all of our, our, our classroom teachers, all of our support staff and specialists to be able to um, run a school that allows for, like I said, constant collaboration amongst um, one another, whether that means support roles with classroom teachers, EL with classroom teachers, whatever it happens to be. Um, but they all have a say in some kind of a way that, that we've come together. Uh, we've walked through a first year of a new schedule, a K to three, a whole new, uh, new school look and then we take the successes, the successes at the end of that year, things that we could do better, walking through the schedule for the first time, make those improvements. So that might come at um, ensuring we're implementing district-wide um, initiatives. So those would have to come in, those would have to be accounted for, in addition to making sure that our classroom and, and, and school um, expectations for high expectations um, are being met based on, like I said, do we have time for, for um, uh, professional development during staff meetings that meet what we need as far as a group here that we know are gonna help to, to build us and, and bolster our, um, our strengths for our students. And um, just to ensure that each year, at the end of each year, we can all come together and recognize what we've done well, make tweaks where we need to. Um, and like I said, just go back to that, that school improvement plan and say this will be our priority for next year because we've done this well. These are things that now we can prioritize for next year moving forward to, to make even better. So to continue those, those progresses and then those areas that um, make our teachers better, make our staff member, our staff member at all roles, um, and make, make us a, a better staff for our students. I think those are all of our, our name questions. We have time for about one more question, and then uh, Marissa will let you kind of say the last few words. Okay. So, we'll take whatever last question you have. Everybody? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, how do you handle challenging parents, and how do you support staff with the difficult parent situations? So that's the first part. Okay. The second part is to describe a situation where you've handled 
challenging here. Okay. Um, I think the first thing to understand is that um, a difficult parent who comes off as difficult, and then on the school lens, the school end, my end, your end, um, what I think it needs to be kept at the forefront is that um, that's the, the, the child's parent. And that child's parent is coming from a place where um, I need the best for my child. I, I'm advocating for my child. I'm advocating for what is right for my child. And then flip over into the school side, and we see our classroom teacher saying, uh, we understand that. Um, but this is why you know we can work together for it. And, and with my involvement in um, an issue with a challenging parent, that's I mean that that should be expected. That they're coming from a place where the best interest of your child. We're coming from a best place where we understand that. But from a school end, this is what we feel like is going to best support your child. So when those two come um, to clash, kind of, um, that's why it's incredibly um, incredibly important to come together to, to come together directly. So you know you can go through your email chain to the point where the tone changes and things kind of get worse until you just stop and say, okay, let's meet. Let's see where we can come together. I'm going to hear your side. You can hear what we feel that we're advocating for as far as your child. Um, and, and you know we'll, we'll see if we can end up in the middle somewhere and just make sure that we can resolve this in the best interest of what is in the best interest of your child. Um, and I guess A, let me think of A, an instance where that happened. I can think of a thousand right now. <laughs> Um, one that comes to mind is a, um, I need a minute. I don't want to be too specific. Uh, retention. So um, at the end or, or mid to end of the school year, um, a parent was advocating very strongly that their child be um, retained for these reasons. Um, immature, uh, not doing well. I feel like th looking at these skills at home and based on your feedback, um, it's just not right. We want to keep him here. We don't want him to move on to the next grade. We don't feel it's going to be, he, he will be successful, and we'd rather have him stay here. Um, the classroom teacher uh, took this information in and said, okay, had, you know, again, with uh, a team approach, brought this to, to all appropriate people to say, this is, you know, let's brainstorm this together. This is what I'm finding. This is what we've kind of been talking to the parent about. It's not, um, yes, where you know the child may need some support in these skills. We feel as if with the right supports, and you know, these, this child will be fine in the next grade. Um, again, with the supports that you know we'll, we'll, we can discuss with the next year's teacher. Um, it got to the point where uh, you know we went back to the parent and said, well, this is what we're finding. We understand what your concerns are. We do. Um, but this, we do, we do feel that the child right now has, has progressed a, 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 such a significant amount since you know we last talked, since our last conference. Um, so we're going to recommend that he move on. We, he needs he's move on. We feel like he's going to have good sol solid peers. We feel like he's going to have the solid supports he needs to be able to um, improve those skills and not fall behind the rest of his peers as an outlier. Um, she doggedly said, I, I, "I need my child. To, it's my child. I need to go on. I need my child to move on." Um, again, given the other, you know, the, the child was very tall for his age, too. So those things had to come in there developmentally. We don't feel like it's going to be um, in his best interest to move on, given, you know, he's going to be towering over the rest of his at some point. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, emotionally kind of um, hopefully not stagnate him or give him an unfortunate uh, feeling about school because right now the child loves school. Um, so we went back and forth, and the, the parent was like, I'm the parent, I'm the parent. I'm, so to the point where, we, you know, it was, it was strong enough where we did not feel that it was going to be in the child's best interest to move on. Um, you know, we had to get the superintendent involved. So, I mean, you know, luckily the superintendent was very supportive, heard everything, um, went through all of the, the, the information that was provided. It wasn't just willy-nilly. We just, it's our, you know, we're going to, you know, go back and forth about this. Um, so, you know, we all met together with the superintendent and, they, uh, and the other people involved who, who instruct the child, who, who, you know, see the child in the course of every day for the past 160 some odd days. Um, the point where um, the parent, now I won't say begrudgingly, but given I feel like the advocacy that we were all putting forward for the child, um, even though the mother staunchly said, I feel like this is what's best for the child at the end, um, I think she appreciated the fact that the team came together in support of this child. We knew the child well. We knew that you know we wanted to give her the confidence that this child would be um, okay going to the next grade. 
um, and we'll make sure that we're, we're keeping a constant, you know, constant c communication about it to make sure the child doesn't fall. Last 30 seconds to just wrap up. Anything you want to uh, speak to the, to the group or anything you want to leave them with? And then I'll walk you out. I, I just want to thank you all for being here. <laughs> Again, as much as I, I hate being here, thank you all for being here. Um, I just need to reiterate that um, since I've come here, it is a, um, it's a district, but it's a school. Um, who knows its students very well. That was, that was noticeable from the very beginning. You all know your students well. You know what they need. Um, and you work together to make sure that they're getting what they need. So for me, that made it easy to come in, made it easy to watch you, and made it easy, uh, hopefully, to be able to support you in, in providing you whatever you needed to make sure that you're able to continue doing what you're doing. Um, I, would be, I would feel extremely honored and fortunate to be able to stay here and continue on with you um, and, and continue to give you the, the, the leadership, the instructional um, supports, and just... Um, the collaboration and collegiality that um, I think we've shared so far. Perfect. Thank you, Russell. All right. You can leave the microphone right there. All right, I'll give you a few minutes to, just to write down. I'm going to uh, bring you another form of a different color paper and uh, give you about five minutes and I'll bring that to the other Okay. So when we talk, you want it to be louder? Uh, no, I can be kind of outdoor. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Williams. Um, I, unfortunately, I had this great scheme that I was going to have it on my laptop, and I was going to read the bio, and then my laptop died. So I don't, I haven't memorized Lisa's a resume, but I think she has. So Lisa, I'm going to ask you, we have about seven questions, seven or so questions sure. for you. Um, it's the same exact questions as the previous round. We'll go one at a time. Uh, everyone will share this microphone. But why don't I start by asking you to just kind of review a little bit about the work you've done, sure. uh, where the communities you've worked in, and then whatever brief introduction to yourself you want to give, and then we'll get okay. started. Great. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, never seen a microphone like this, but, uh, um, so first of all, I just want to say I am absolutely thrilled to be here, so, um, it's very excited to, uh, get the call and be invited, so thanks so much. Um, so my, okay, my career started in the early 90s. And in Lexington, in the Lexington Public Schools. And I actually was in Lexington for 31 years. I was a, a classroom teacher for 28 of those years. Um, I taught all grades throughout the years. I taught kindergarten through fifth grade, with the exception of first grade. I student taught in first grade, but I never uh, taught my own classroom in uh, first grade. But so I have a great, you know, it, I actually loved each and every grade level I taught. People always ask, what's your great favorite grade? And I really and truly loved each one. And I think it's just teaching is teaching. From my perspective, I think teaching is teaching. You just adapt to what your students need. So, um, so yeah, so in the 90s, I taught at one school in Lexington, and then uh, we were, when I was teaching fifth grade in 1999, um, my principal at the time, they were hiring, Lexington has six elementary schools, and so they were hiring new assistant principals, and, and three of them, and then the next year they were going to hire three, uh, you know, assistant principals for the other three schools. So my principal had asked, had I ever considered administration? Would I consider working with him as his new assistant principal? And in that moment, that completely took me by surprise. And I said, no, I never thought of it. And no, thank you. And um, But what it did is it planted the seeds of so the next year. I actually um, did apply and uh, ended up being assistant principal just for two years uh, at Fisk School, where I was a student teacher and uh, started. Uh, I was a student teacher in Building Hub. So that was kind of funny. Um, I went there for assistant principal for two years and then the override failed. They reduced the position to point two and I was actually, ha I, I had learned so much. I loved being assistant principal, but I really was still a teacher, you know, teacher at heart, happy to go back to the classroom. That's when I went into kindergarten and actually cried, literally, because I was like, I don't and um, but then stayed for 10 years you know ended up loving kindergarten uh, making that adjustment and then ended up going back you know when um, things were becoming more and more academic I ended up going back into the older grades I taught third grade I taught fourth grade for a year I taught fifth grade again and that's what I was teaching when I decided um, 
to, I had still had that bee in my bonnet about administration, so I went back to finish the leadership program um, during COVID, and then, um, then the position opened up in my school. I was an interim AP in Lexington for a year, uh, and then I ended up getting the position in Sudbury. I'm at two schools, actually, in Sudbury, half time at each, so um, I love it because I know two sc fabulous school communities and that many more students and teachers, and it's challenging going, you know, to be in two schools. So, um, so yeah, I feel ready. Like I feel ready to uh, take on the next challenge and, um, you know, kind of share what I've learned and continue learning from all of you. So, um, and then on a personal note, I have two young adult children. I have a 25-year-old daughter who is. A, an RN at Children's Hospital in Boston, and then I have a son, um, a 22-year-old son who is an auto mechanic. So it's a little stereotypical, but that's, um, um, so they're launched, and that's actually is also what prompted me to think, okay, this is a good time because my own children were kind of launched. So, so um, that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> so, so. Hi. Oh, hi. Yes. Hi. Good to see nice you. To Thank see you, you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, how would you go about building rapport and fostering unity within the school, thinking about staff, students, and families? Right. Okay. Um, so, actually, I think that's the most important thing as a principal and actually any educator in the school. Um, building, you know, building those. Uh, relationships and connections, trusting relationships and fostering connections um, with the students, with the children, um, with the staff and amongst the staff um, and with the families. And so much is about communication and keeping those lines of communication open. So, you know, just to start, you know, as a person brand new to Burbank School, I think I would need to, uh, well, I would definitely, um, you know, start meeting with individual staff members and, um, you know, have, have the, you know, times where I can really sit down and learn about what's important and what's, you know, what, what the, um, yes, what's important to all of you and kind of things that your hopes for what, what do you hope might change in the future, you know, not immediately, but what might, what are those things that kind of bug you um, and then you know do the same for the families have you know the the um, events on the playgrounds or you know the visiting hours for families uh, so getting to know families and and then for the children yeah you know yes it's a summer thing on the playground but also really being present in the classrooms um, uh, you know maintaining you know, keeping the joy in the school through uh, all school meetings. Um, I do a lot of student lunches. Um, we do, we have a PBIS program in one of our schools, not in the other, um, maintaining those connections, but really uh, creating opportunities to have those conversations with students, visit the classrooms, see what they're doing, see what they're learning, and uh, helping foster the excitement. Um, but, you know, pretty much open communication. Uh, also, of course, the newsletters and the updates and, um, and staff meetings that are worthwhile to everyone and meaningful. Um, so, yes. Great. Thanks. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again, Thank too. You. Um, so can you describe your leadership style and what a typical day as principal would look like for you? Okay. Um, typical day for a principal. So my leadership style is um, definitely definitely collaborative. I am a huge collaborator, um, and I will make the important decisions. Like I remember being, you know, in staff meetings and having conversations and being like, just to tell us what to do. You know, I don't want to be part of that decision. So you know, so but um, the important things, you know, definitely collaborative. Um, you know, decisions uh, should be shared, you know, a lot of shared decisions in terms of the priorities of the schools, making sure we're in alignment with the school improvement plan, the core values. Um, a typical day for, for me would be, you know, of course, starting the day greeting 
greeting everyone, greeting the children uh, when they arrive to school off the buses or out of their cars, um, and welcoming, welcoming the children, welcoming you. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, it's funny. This year, I am in one school where. Um, you know, we have morning announcements in one school, we don't in the other. I tend to like them, but again, that would, I would have to ask the staff, like, what is the culture here? Is that something that feels like it's interrupting, or is it something that really enhances um, the, the culture here? And so, um, so it depends. So perhaps uh, uh, morning announcements, I like to involve the students um, in the morning announcements, and then, um, and then making the rounds and visiting classrooms. Of course, um, there will be meetings throughout the day. You know, we have um, a very, you know, well, there's um, the instructional support team meeting, student support team meeting, which is like with the health team and the team chair and myself, where we every week we meet and talk about um, students. Um, you know, students who have specific needs, um, anything that's going on in the school. Um, so there's, of course, the um, important meetings, you know, important meetings that have to happen. And then um, I like to be visible as much as possible, recesses, lunches, um, classrooms, and then fully participating in arrival and dismissal, and then also being realistic that things interrupt. You know, there might be behaviors and there, um, that, you know, yeah, there, there's other happenings in the school, obviously. So, um, so yes, uh, I that's my from, from Brenda Johnson. I think that's two part of it. She's a classroom educator. Okay, thanks. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Good, thanks. Um, first, we'd like to um, have you discuss a little bit about your understanding of early um, literacy and mm -hmm. math, considering we're going to be a K to three school next year. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So early literacy and math. I mean, this is K to three. It's um, the initial introduction, uh, you know, to to learning for children, um, there needs to be, um, you know, as much hands-on, you know, hands-on um, uh, play and discovery uh, as possible. Right now, we're doing uh, intensive training on keys, you know, with keys to literacy in Sudbury, um, really incorporating. Um, the language piece um, into the content areas, and then also doing studies about uh, the science of reading and how children really, um, how children really learn to read. You know, I all through my years, you know, I was definitely a Lucy Calkins girl. You know, a Lucy Calkins uh, teacher, and but always had this, uh, always feeling like I had, I loved it, and I felt like I needed to supplement with, you know, the word study and the phonics and. Um, and so now what we're learning is, yes, the students really need, really need that direct, explicit instruction um, for the literacy development. And the same goes with the math, you know, very concrete, um, tactile experiences, uh, regardless of how, you know, all, you know, yes, you have children in uh, varying uh, levels of their development in terms of learning and the different um, concepts, but they all need those experiences, those hands-on experiences, um, and yeah. T um, so I think the difference between uh, the primary grades and the older grades is really the time that's spent on those early, those experiences of exploring and discovering and learning. So great, thanks. And a follow-up question to that is. Um, when you go into a classroom, mm -hmm. what do you expect to see the children actually doing? I think you touched upon this a yes. little bit, but as if you're coming in to evaluate, what do you what are you looking for the, right. the teacher to be doing, the children to be doing? Right. Um, you know, going into a classroom, I really hope to see. Um, of course, it might be a time when the teacher is giving, you know, having a teacher directed lesson. Um, I would hope that it wouldn't go on and on and on, um, that, you know, it's very purposeful and, um, you know, there's a time limit to it. And then students, I would really look for, you know, are the students, um, can they see themselves around the classroom? Are there visual supports and visual charts? Um, you know, diverse books and materials. Do you have the manipulatives out 
so children can access them at any time in the day. Do the children have open access to the library, the classroom library? Um, and then in terms of the learning in the lesson, um, I feel it's really important for children, all children, to be able to, to be having a voice and being heard um, and feeling like experts throughout the day. Um, you know, so often, you know, we have children who are much more comfortable raising their hands and volunteering and um, so opportunities for like the, the partner learning and the small group learning and different ways for children to show their learning. So different, so if a child isn't volunteering, raising their hand, perhaps you have a way for them to show it on a whiteboard or, um, you know, share it with it, talk about it with their partner or having different ways for children to um, know that what they have to share and what they're thinking is really important and valued. So that's what I'd be looking for is kind of like the student engagement and um, their involvement in the lesson. So. Hi, Hi, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> what is your experience in and how do you see yourself supporting students with diverse learning needs and their families in our school community? Right. And I can say it again because it's a long one if you want. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, no, I think, I think I've got it. So um, thank you. <laughs> um, so one thing that has been really beneficial in terms of my own professional learning is that I have throughout the years, right from the beginning, have worked very closely, either as a classroom teacher um, or as an administrator, I worked very closely with different specialized programs. And of course, you know, students um, who are, um, have received special education services who aren't in a specialized uh, program. But, um, so I worked very closely with um, the language learning uh, program uh, in my first school as the second grade and fifth grade um, and fourth grade, um, you know, collaborative um, integrated teacher. So really co-taught a lot with the language-based teacher um, and worked so well in terms of um, making sure that the children can be uh, integrated in, through the uh, regular education day and get what they need. Um, so, and then, uh, you know, very similar with the intensive learning program in Lexington, that's for students with autism. Very, uh, very similar with in Sudbury, we work, we have the partners program, which is a collaborative with the uh, New England Center for Children, for children with autism as well. Um, and it's an amazing program as well. And then we have the STEPS program, which is for children with uh, varying uh, cognitive profiles. And then at Nixon School, also in Sudbury, we have the access program, which is an emo emotional behavioral program that supports children in, um, which is also an amazing program. So I have worked intensely with those programs throughout the year. So we have regular meetings um, and really talk about the children and their needs. And then I make sure I'm in those classrooms as well and making sure I'm spending, um, as, uh, you know, making sure that those children, no matter what we're planning throughout the day, throughout our days and throughout our year, we're making sure that every single day, every child has access to whatever we're doing and that the communication is there. So sometimes what happens is when children are having service, they have services. I don't think there's, there are no specialized programs in this school, correct? So, so if there's chi children with services, you know, they we need to go out for speech or whatever. Um, if there's a special program in the classroom, it's like really crucial we make sure that the communication is happening there so that children aren't missing anything because that unfortunately sometimes happens. Um, in terms of making sure, meeting uh, with the parents, I know, um, you know, we do have conversations, you know, meet with the CPAC um, co-chairs in Sudbury, and then also just kind of keeping those connections. I'm very, I'm very, work very closely with our team chair and get to, and I attend a lot of IEP meetings. Specific, you know, it depends on, um, you know, spends, uh, depends on the children and their needs and so on, but I go to a lot of IEP meetings and, and, um, and work with the team chair to get to know the families as well. So, I, was that this clear? Yes. Yeah, there is, but there's a little follow-up question which you kind of touched upon, yes. but I want to just ask it anyway. Yes. Um, how do you support the staff in supporting diverse learning needs? Mm -hmm. um, so, Yes, it's really important um, because, you know, I try to 
make sure, I think my role as principal is to really make sure that I'm understanding, you know, your situation as the classroom teacher and your students and your students' needs so I can be aware of the supports and make sure that you, the structures are set up, the schedule is set up so that you actually have that consultation time with the special educators and uh, the communication is so important so that it's more of a partnership. Um, Oftentimes, you know, the, the schedules are so dense, the special education schedules, service schedules are so full. You know, the, it, the consults can sometimes go by, you know, unfortunately go by the wayside. And I think it's really important that we make sure that we preserve those consult times. Um, and then, of course, if there's any challenges, I would hope you would, you know, that we would be communicating and you could let me know what supports you're looking for, or how I can support you. Um, the great thing is I, I've been there in terms of having, you know, having that daily challenge of trying to meet the needs of a, you know, of a child who you just don't have the, you know, you want the answers and it's just challenging. And so working through it, um, working through it together is so important. Like never leaving anyone on an island alone. Yeah, so. Thank you. Hi. Uh, what steps would you take to support a child who's having behavior difficulties? Okay. Um, do you have a specific idea of what kind of behavior? Just kind of any behavior. Okay. Go so. for it. Okay. So as assistant principal, that is pretty much what I do every single day. And um, I definitely use a restorative approach. I, I think um, it sounds cliche, and it kind of is cl cliche, but I believe wholeheartedly it's true. Behavior is communication. I believe every single child in the school wants to do well and wants to uh, know they're welcome, that they're an important part of the school. And sometimes there's life th things in their, their lives that get in the way or feelings inside that get in the way. So I think my job is to um, sit down with the child and try to figure out what is the source. And often they don't know. They, you know, when they're in there in the moment, they don't understand they don't know themselves, so helping uh, to figure it out, making sure that they're getting the services they need. If it's a child who perhaps um, is already connected with the school counselor or get receiving services, maybe, maybe not, but making sure I'm communicating with those staff members as well so I can gather the information before meeting with the child. So then I meet with the child, figure out what, you know, see if I can figure out what the source of the problem is. And then if someone was um, harmed, uh, you know, talking with that, meeting with that child, figure out what happened, if it's possible, if it feels appropriate, bringing the children together to really hear their, I think it's important for them to understand each other's perspectives, have one child understand, <coughs> no, he really didn't intend, it wasn't his mission today to hurt you. Um, this is what was happening, this is why it happened, and he's remorseful, or she's, you know, they're remorseful. So. Um, really understanding the perspective and then let the child who was harmed really explain how they felt when, when it happened and how it impacted them. And I think that's where the learning happens. So I try to take those behavioral um, circum, you know, those behavioral, those behaviors as learning opportunities. Uh, and typically, you know, it does, it, it helps, the restorative approach helps dramatically. And yes, sometimes we need consequences, you know, we need the, sometimes those natural consequences and sometimes we just need um, another consequence, you know, so um, today, uh, uh, well, no, I won't say that. Um, so, um, you know, so sometimes, and then of course, always communicating with the teachers, always communicating with the parents. I always, if I ever have a conversation with a child, I always call the parents, even if it's something really mild, I just say, I just want you to know I had this conversation with your child. And so so I, I want to respect uh, the teacher's time. And so if any of them have to get up and leave, don't yes. that person. OK. Say three, yes. Three, four, yes. Three, ten, Sorry. Now. We do have Lisa O'Sullivan with one question and Sarah Pearson with one question. Okay. And I also want to respect your time because I think we started you five minutes. Oh, yeah. Ago. So okay. if people can stick on, that would be great. If I have three hours. Nothing, nothing <laughs> <personal>. so. <laughs> uh, Lisa Thanks. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. So to be successful in this position, mm -hmm. what would you have accomplished in your first several years? Uh, my greatest priority, because I think it's the most important thing for students to be able to learn, is to really create a joyful school community. I mean, 
it seems like you already have a joyful school community, but enhance and continue a joyful school community where children and staff wake up in the morning and really are eager to get to school. Um, that's my greatest priority. I want to wake up in the mornings and be eager to come to school. Um, so really fostering that positive school community um, uh, through you know celebrations, all school meetings, um, you know, getting to know all of you and having us decide. Uh, one, uh, one thing that made a big difference uh, this year in one of my schools that I would love to continue if the structures of uh, Belmont, uh, the district, and uh, Burbank allow for it is, you know, often we have all these committees in the schools, you know, and with great initiatives, um, but often they're held before school, after school, and only a few people can do that. And so it falls on the shoulders on the same few people and with no, you know, with no expectation that, you know, it, it's hard when it's before or after school. So this year, one staff meeting a month is dedicated to committees. So at the beginning of the year, we met as a staff, we looked at school improvement plan, we decided what are our priorities as a school? What committees do we want to have this year? So we came up with five, SEL, school meeting, equity, um, SEL, oh, I said SEL. Um, I know, uh, anyway, brain freeze. But So we have five committees that the staff came up with and then, um, then they all gave their preferences, where does your passion lie? And then, so everyone is on a committee doing, and we're doing amazing, they, or everyone is doing amazing things. A lot of progress, shared responsibility. So I guess that's what I want, is a sense of shared responsibility and community. So we have the, this um, community week they came up with, and now they just, and during the Valentine's week, which was incredible, um, that was the SEL committee, and then now we have another community week, and it's just kind of, taken a life of its own. So, so just kind of like the shared sense of shared community, positivity, uh, and I think that's when children thrive and learn, and then we can really dive in and do the, the um, tougher stuff, that, you know, of course, and keep doing that, um, you know, keep the children learning, so. All right, Sarah, close it up for us. Okay. All right, last question. Yes. Um, how do you handle challenging parents? Mm -hmm. And how do you support staff with difficult parent situations? Right. And then if you could touch on a situation where sure. you've had to handle a hard parent. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think um, with all parents and, you know, parents who are particularly heightened, I, you know, being as transparent and forthcoming as possible, giving all the facts, um, having the two-way conversation, um, you know, listening, making sure they know you're listening and they're being heard. Um, it's okay to disagree and respectfully disagree, but as long as you're, you know, that they know I'm listening, I'm hearing them, you know, being willing to flex and make adjustments if appropriate, when appropriate, um, and then also they need to hear our reasoning and um, where we're coming from. And um, sometimes they're able to hear it and sometimes they're not. So, um, but I just stick to my values. So I, you know, if I know in my heart what, what I feel and what the staff member feels is the right thing, uh, you know, we stick to it, but we do flex where we can with the, um, with the less important, you know, if there's something that is less important. So let me think of an example. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, we had, it's not a severe example, but it's an example. We had a, uh, we, uh, we had a situation where a family, um, both parents are educators, you know, nice people, but they, they can get heightened and their child will come home and say, children are picking, you know, or he, he's getting targeted, he's getting targeted at recess, children are picking on him daily, and the staff who are outside in the classroom, teachers like, actually, no, he's kind of, his behaviors are a bit provoking. Um, it's actually not accurate. Uh, so, you know, so what I did is started, um, and the, so the, the, t the parents were sending emails and calling, and so of course I listened to them, and then I, so I investigated, and I talked to several children, and I, you know, ind individually, in a discreet manner, talked with the staff involved, and then called the family, and then met with the child, of course, and the children involved, and, um, 
and then met with the you know met with the family and shared what I learned and was very honest and um, and then gave them the plan of how we plan to move forward um, and they did not like hearing that their child was not telling the truth they were insisting that he tells the truth all the time and I said well I, you know. I'm sure he most often does, and I'm not saying, I, I'm like, whatever reason, he does feel targeted, but the fact, what I have learned, and just kept reiterating what we learned from everybody else, like everyone else is, you know, sharing um, these facts. Uh, and then now I have lunch with that little boy every Friday, and then we've built a relationship, and so he comes to me if he has, you know, any um, worries and complaints. But um, that family had, there were a few instances where they kept saying he was being targeted, and it was hard for them to hear that he was actually having some challenges. So, so, that, yes. Oh, and the teacher and I called the parents together on speakerphone, came to my office and called the family a couple times together just to give the update and touch base. Mm -hmm. so. Lisa, thank you for that. That is, thank uh, you. That is the gauntlet. That okay. We have so, why don't I give thank you, the last, you just 20 or 30 seconds just to close okay. it out, and, uh, and then I'll walk you out. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you having me, and the questions uh, helped me get to know Burbank School even better, and it really, um, the, the you know, the potential, you know, the thought of being here and join, joining your school uh, community is just so exciting for me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So I, I'm going to walk Lisa out. I will uh, leave right on the chair on the, on the way out um, my, these documents. If you want to fill them out, you can leave them here. If you want to inter-office them for me, just get them to me before Friday afternoon, the end of the day. And if you want to wait for the online form, that will come out tomorrow, and that will be available through Sunday. Three different ways you can give feedback. Thank and you. also, Thank you can you so always. Much. Uh, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What time is the panel? 610.